Remember that in the last video lectures, we learned that Mill wants to add another consideration to Bentham's quantitative considerations, namely the uh, quality of pleasures. And we saw that he basically thinks that when the quality of a pleasure is higher than that of another, then it, it ends up being preferable or should be counted as having higher utility uh, than the alternative, even though or even if the higher quality pleasure is lower in quantity of pleasure. And that's represented uh, in the two columns on this slide. So I want to go into a little more detail about why Mill thinks that this is the case and um, how we tell which pleasures have greater quality than others. So if that's our question, how do we tell which pleasures have greater quality than others, Mill gives an answer, which is an informed preference test. And he describes this test as follows. If I am asked what I mean by difference of quality and pleasures, or what makes one pleasure more valuable than another merely as a pleasure, except it's being greater in amount, there is but one possible answer. Of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, that is all or almost all people who have an experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the more desirable pleasure. Now, the reason why he has to put the moral obligation issue to the side is because here he's just trying to come up with a standard for saying whether a pleasure is better or worse than another, okay? So he doesn't want to mix that up with the question of right and wrong. He just wants to basically um, be able to clarify why, why we would ever say it's preferable to choose a higher quality pleasure over a lower quality pleasure in terms of how happy it makes someone. So the moral issue he's putting to the side, this is just a question about how much uh, happiness would be generated by a given pleasure. Um, he goes on, if one of the two is, by those who are competently equated with both, placed so far above the other that they prefer it, even though knowing it to be attended with a greater amount of discontent, and would not resign it for any quantity of the other pleasure which their nature is capable of, we're justified in ascribing to the preferred enjoyment a superiority in quality, so far outweighing quantity as to render it in comparison of small account. Okay, so what he has in mind here is, and, and we're going to look at a couple examples of this in just a moment, that if we have two um, pleasures that we're choosing between, and we ask, um, apart from the question of the total quantity, we ask, well, among those, those um, people who have an experience of both of those types of pleasures, um, do uh, those people tend to prefer or do almost all of them, he says, all or almost all of them, strongly prefer one pleasure over the other, regardless of the total quantity. And if it turns out that they that most people strongly prefer one of those pleasures, even, even when it has less total quantity of pleasure in its favor, then that's a case where we can say that that pleasure is higher quality than the other. So it's the preference of choosers who have an experience of both kinds of pleasure that matters for determining the quality of a pleasure. Let's look at a couple of examples. Here are some examples that Mill gives that also help to make the case for the view that the so-called higher pleasures or the pleasures that use higher faculties, as he's um, described it elsewhere, uh, are generally preferred by those who have an experience of both the pleasures that involve higher faculties and those that don't. They're generally preferred even if the total quantity of pleasure in, um, in those pleasures involving the higher faculties is less than in the alternatives. So here is his uh, the case he makes. It's an unquestionable fact that those who are equally acquainted with and equally capable of appreciating and enjoying both do give a most marked preference to the manner of existence which employs their higher faculties. And now he gives a couple of examples which are also arguments for this claim. 
Few human creatures would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though they should be persuaded that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs. So we can express Mill's thinking here by posing a series of questions, and I encourage you to ask yourself these questions, okay? So say I offered you a series of deals, okay? The first deal is this one, and, and tell me whether you would take the deal or not, okay? So the deal is this. Right now, you're on your way to live a life, a human life, that involves some ups and downs, okay? It'll involve some disappointments. Um, coronavirus probably has involved some disappointments and frustrations. Guess what? The rest of your life is going to involve frustrations and appointments, as well as joyful experiences and victories and, and, and other good things, okay? But the, the basic point there is, in all likelihood, we're all going, going forward into a life that involves some happiness and some unhappiness, some pleasure and some pain, okay? It's a mixed bag, and that's kind of just the way that it is in human life, all right? So then the question is, if I offer you in return for your human life an extremely happy life, but the only trick is that you'll be a pig. So you basically will just have the cognitive faculties of a pig. You will, you know, you'll, you'll think pig thoughts rather than human thoughts, and you'll have pig experiences rather than human experiences. But you'll be the happiest pig that has ever existed, just super, super happy pig, okay? Would you take the trade-off? Would you choose to live an extremely happy pig life in return for um, or in exchange for your moderately happy or slightly unhappy human life? And why or why not? Now, when I pose this question, you know, if you think about it, but most people say, no way, I would rather be a human being um, unsatisfied than somewhat unsatisfied than be a pig that's extremely happy. And if you ask, why is that? It's not really because of the quantity of pleasure, because the very um, choice that I'm presenting you is one where the quantity of pleasure is higher in option two than in option one. But uh, it, it's probably because of something like the quality of pleasure. That's at least Mill's argument. That's the reason why people choose option one over option two. And, and what, it, what it means that they choose option one rather than option two is that option one has higher quality pleasures in it, like the pleasure, the pleasure of being able to figure things out, to understand what's going on. Those kinds of higher cognitive faculty pleasures are so important to us once we've had an experience of them that we wouldn't give them up for almost anything. Um, and again, that's what Mill has in mind by higher quality pleasures. And you can pose a similar kind of question here for two other attributes or in two other examples. So one is, suppose I offer you in return for, again, your kind of moderately happy human life, an extremely happy life, but the only, the only catch is that you have to give up 30 IQ points, okay? So you have to become significantly less um, cognitively able than you are right now. Um, by the way, that, that idea of IQ is a little bit antiquated. It's probably not just this thing that's in your head that could be changed as simply as that, um, because it depends on like what kind of interactions and reading material and so on that you're, that you're uh, consuming this week may make a difference to your IQ. I, people's IQs can fluctuate over the course of their lives just based on um, what else they're doing and how they're kind of exercising their brains and what they're doing. But um, the basic idea is that um, the basic idea is that you have a choice between going on and living your life with a greater amount of cognitive awareness, but uh, more unhappy in a quantitative sense as a result of that, or um, more blissfully ignorant, as they sometimes say, like n just n n not as able to figure things out, not as aware, um, behaving more um, foolishly as um, 
as Mill describes it, actually, being a fool, being less intelligent. Um, and the cost of that, uh, or sorry, the, the um, in return for that lack of intelligence, you're going to live a happier life in a quantitative sense. And most people, when presented with this choice, you know, would you like to live a happier life, a much happier life at the cost of 30 IQ points? Most people say, no, hold on to the IQ. I can, I'll weather the storm of uh, ups and downs, but I wouldn't give up um, this thing, my, my cognitive abilities, uh, for that price. And another example that Mill gives is um, the trade-off between a, a moderately happy life that involves noble action and service, so kind of um, ethical life that involves doing good things. Um, if, if we could become happier, extremely happy even, but the cost of doing that would be that we would live a selfish and base life, that is, give up on those noble actions and service and just do, um, just, just live a life that involves pursuing our own pleasure. Most people would not choose that. And so again, he thinks the fact that most people choose the things in option one over the things in option two, that if they were presented with the choice, they choose option one rather than option two, um, at least most people, sorry, I have to clarify here, most people who are informed about both, that is, who actually have an experience of both. Um, among those who have an experience of both, uh, the preference is generally for the first column. This tells us that these are higher quality pleasures. And Mill summarizes these points as follows in what is probably the most famous line from this text. It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. It's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig is of a different opinion, it is because they only know their side of the question. The other party to the comparison knows both sides. So um, the last point there is that it's very important that the that the informed preference test um, be based just on the preferences of those who are informed about both kinds of pleasure. Because if you ask the pig which they would choose, then they don't actually have an experience of the pleasures of higher cognition and thinking and inquiry and so on. And so they, the pig very well might choose to live a very, very happy pig life because they don't really know what they're choosing between. They don't have an experience of the things in option in the, in the first column on the last slide. And likewise with the fool. So the fool um, doesn't have an experience of the higher cognitive faculties. And so if it's a question between being a fool or being Socrates, I think probably by fool here, Mill Moore has in mind somebody who is uneducated, not necessarily someone who is He's, he's not really describing sort of innate cognitive faculties. It's more about sort of how somebody behaves and what their um, what their uh, what they know about the world, like how 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 much understanding they have of things. Okay, but the idea there is that like somebody who doesn't have much understanding, who for instance had never had an experience of um, of really pursuing the truth in like an academic setting, in like a scientific setting, you know, has never um, uh, done work in a laboratory or, or um, even in like a school lab in a science class, uh, or who has never, um, who has never read Shakespeare and understood Shakespeare, you know, or read great literature and um, had a facility with the language that allowed them to understand what they were reading and appreciate it. That actually the opinion of such people about which is better great literature or, or pursuit of science or um, just uh, every kind of everyday animal pleasures like eating and drinking and so on, that the opinions of those people don't count for this particular test because, the, again, they're not informed about both. And this, um, this part of Mill's uh, account of higher quality of pleasures. This informed informed part of the informed preference test is actually somewhat controversial. So to help to see why this is controversial, um, imagine the following set of options, okay? Um, 
So say that all Las Vegas residents are faced with a choice. They can either vote for a annual Shakespeare festival that will be free for them to attend. Um, a few Shakespeare plays will be performed every year um, and it's free for residents to uh, attend and see them and only residents can attend and see them. We'd, I introduced that last qualification to make it easier to imagine in the Las Vegas context where so many things end up getting kind of swamped by tourists. Um, the second option is for every Las Vegas resident to just get a free six pack of beer, okay? So what Mill would say about this, um, about the choice between these options, if we're trying to, if we're trying to tell which one is the higher quality pleasure, then we ought to restrict the set of votes that we count for deciding that issue about which is the higher quality pleasure, just to those um, voters who have an experience of both. That is, voters who know enough about Shakespeare and have enough of an experience and kind of training in how to interpret Shakespeare and appreciate it, that they um, are able to decide between the six pack of beer and the Shakespeare. Because Shakespeare is kind of, um, is hard to appreciate if you don't have the, uh, some degree of training and experience with it. And so, you know, people who have taken a Shakespeare course, people who have tried to read the plays, have been helped in reading the plays by others, maybe people who have a little bit of a theater background themselves and have, um, you know, read, read through some Shakespeare, or even performed some Shakespeare, they are certainly going to be competent and, and, and they also have to have had some experience with beer, okay? But people who have had an experience of both are going to be competent judges of this choice. But Mill says people who have not had an experience of both, which might include a lot of Las Vegas residents who haven't really had that kind of deeper experience of Shakespeare, they're not gonna be able to decide which is actually better. And so their votes shouldn't count for the question of which of these two is the higher quality pleasure. And that view is controversial because a lot of people have said that this position of Mills ends up being elitist, it ends up favoring certain pleasures over others in a um, unjustified way, uh, that we, we can't manageably articulate what the standards are of, of um, sufficient, uh, sufficient experience with a pleasure to be able to say um, who deserves a vote and who doesn't deserve a vote within the um, within this test. So I'm just giving you, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'm just trying to give you some of the reasons that people have given for why the informed uh, preference test, the informed part of the informed preference test is uh, is questionable. Okay, so what we have seen so far is that Utilitarianism in Mill's formulation says that we should favor higher quality pleasures over lower quality ones when we're calculating total utility. And he's also said that the measure of the quality of pleasures is the informed preference test. And finally, he said that informed judges prefer pleasures that employ higher faculties like learning, the arts, and noble actions. And so therefore, in Mill's formulation, utilitarianism actually favors pleasures that employ higher faculties. It treats those pleasures as of higher utility than the lower quality pleasures, the pleasures that, in, that um, may be higher quantitatively, but uh, are not as high qualitatively. And here I wanna leave you with a couple of questions. So, do you think that there's a legitimate difference between qualities of pleasure, as Mill argues that there are? Do you think that Mill's method of distinguishing between qualities of pleasures is a good one, that is the informed preference test? And then finally, do you think Mill is right that pleasures employing higher faculties would be preferred according to the informed preference test? Do you think that the higher faculty pleasures actually would be preferred by those who have an experience of both? And uh, because the, these lectures are, this video lecture is getting a bit long, I'm gonna pause here and take things up again in the next one.